in the life of a computer scientist, at some point they will be blessed with encountering a data structure that is so wonderful, so beautiful, so aesthetically pleasing that they can't help but fall in love with it. This has happened to me twice, and I wish to introduce to you one of my most beloved data structures, the hash array mapped try or HAMAT. However, witnessing the HAMAT with an unprepared mind would overwhelm it. So I'm going to explain some lesser data structures so you will be ready to observe full wonder of the HAMAT. All of these data structures that I talk about solves the problem of looking up a value via a key. We call the data structures that allow us to do this a lookup table or an index. And we, the information that is being stored are called records. This is an extremely common thing that a computer needs to do. Most of the time, solving this problem is already done for us. These are handled by libraries or built-in functionality of the computer language that you're using. I could tell you that knowing a about how these things operate will allow you to know which library is best to use and make you a better programmer. But that is bogus. I am telling you this because these things have a captivating, abstract wonder to them, and I need to share me my joy with you. The simplest way to implement a lookup table is to write key value pairs in memory one after the other. Whenever we want to look up a record, we simply check each key until we find the correct one. However, this is ugly and bad. On average, every time we want to look up a record, we are going to have to search through half of the keys to find it. This also has horrendous scaling problem. If we double the number of records we have, we also double the number of steps we have to do to find our record. For anything other than a tiny number of records, this search is going to be too slow to be useful. If we look at a graph of time taken versus the number of records, it forms a straight line. Things with this type of scaling operate in what we call linear time. This solution to a lookup table is called linear search after its horrendous performance. We can do a lot better than that. If our keys are an unbroken sequence of counting numbers starting from zero and going up, then we can store the records according to their key. We put record zero, in the zeroth spot, record one in the next slot, etc. Then it is a simple matter of multiplying key by the size of the record and adding the memory location of the zeroth record, allowing us to jump directly to the record we are interested in. This means that the lookup takes the same amount of time no matter how many records there are. This type of scaling is called constant time scaling, and it's the best possible scaling we can get for lookups. This structure is called an array, but it has downsides. If our index has gaps in it, then such a system would be very wasteful. We could end up with a situation where the array would be larger than the amount of memory that we have in the computer, but it would mostly be empty. Sometimes, if our key range is small and our records have gaps in it, we can use a modification of an array. First, as a part of our index structure, we set aside a section of memory as a map of our data structure, a map made of bits, a bit map. In this bit map, each bit corresponds to a possible key. So if our bit map is a 16-bit number, the least significant bit will correspond to the key value of zero and the most significant bit will correspond to the key value of 15. If the record with the corresponding key is present, the bits value will be set to one. And if it's absent, the bit value will be set to zero. You can know which record is present by checking if the bit map value is set. And we can work out the memory location of the record by counting all the bits set to the right of this. This tells you how many records you'll need to skip over to find your needed record. Bit counting is required for certain code breaking techniques, and a certain US government agency has required this feature as a built-in operation all the computers that it buys. Because
course of this, bit counting is supported as an assembly command in most CPUs and GPUs. This is the bitmapped sparse array. The bitmap sparse array is a good solution if we have less than about 64 keys. More than that, all of our clever bit trickery won't work as well. However, since there are so many big gaps, there is a way to make use of that. You could allocate a region of space in memory, and if the key goes out of that range, just have it wrap back on itself. If we are lucky, then all of the records will fall into the gaps. If we are unlucky, we could end up with records being allocated to the same place a problem that is called a collision. We can mitigate a collision by having the colliding element be placed in the next memory slot afterwards. Then you would basically do a linear search once you've jumped to near the right place. There is other rooms for improvement as well. Wrapping the key around corresponds to the modulus or remainder function. However, it is not a good function for this role. If two keys are separated by a multiple of the size of the memory, they would collide. So what we really want is a function that ensures that records are scattered evenly over the allocated space. The functions that are good at reducing keys down to a limited range are called hash functions. And we call this type of structure a hash table. Hash functions have some great advantages. They can take a key of any size and convert it down to a constant size. So we can use any string as a key rather than it having to be a number. Most of the time, a hash table has a constant lookup time like an array. However, there are a few unpleasant downsides. If a hash table has a lot of collisions or is almost full, then the behavior can degrade to being as bad as a linear search. If our hash table can't becomes full and we wish to expand it, the size of the hash table is a part of the calculation that dictates where the item gets stored. So when we expand the space, we have to move everything out around to new places. Because of how long a hash table takes to store and retrieve records is dependent on what the keys are in the hash table, it is possible to determine what keys are present in the hash table by using carefully constructed keys. This allows information to be leaked from a hash structure and can present privacy and cybersecurity issues. If we wish to list everything in a hash table, the order that the items come out in is going to be random. What is even worse is if you do something while stepping through the items that causes the hash table to grow or shrink in size, the ordering of the elements inside the hash table are going to change. You might end up hitting the same element twice or missing elements in that case. That being said, for many applications, hash tables are the best lookup structures. However, the downside means we should also look at other structures that may be better. We can take the records and store them in order of their keys. Now, when you are searching for a record, you can start in the middle, then you can compare the keys. If the record is below your target key, then you can eliminate half of the records and you don't need to search them. The same if the record key is above your target. Now, you can treat the smaller range just like you treated the larger range. Go to the middle, compare the keys. You keep doing this until you reach the record that you are looking for. Because at each point you are making a decision that cuts the problem into halves, this is called a binary search. A sorted list with a binary search is very efficient and has great scaling properties. If you double the number of records, you only have to add one more step. The graph of its speed is logarithmic. However, it has some downsides. You have to sort the records, which is okay if you have to do it once and you're doing many searches afterwards. But if you are doing many inserts, you have to sort and move around all the records 
every time you do an insert. However, the records don't have to be in the order that they are in physical memory for the binary search algorithm to work. All the computer needs to know is which record to jump to when things are lower or higher. We could add to the record the memory location to go to if the target key is smaller and the memory location to go to if the target key is larger. These memory location records that point to the next record are called pointers. Diagramming the memory like this is kind of hard to follow. And since the physical location in memory no longer matters, how about we just look at this structure abstractly? Because the structure branches off from itself, computer scientists call this a tree. The place where everything starts is called the root, and computer scientists normally draw a tree with the root at the top of the page and the branches going down because they spend too much time indoors and don't know what trees actually look like. Each point where branches split off is called a node, and the nodes that are linked below a particular node are called that node's children. Likewise, the node above is called that node's parent. Because these type of trees have two children, they're called binary trees. If there is any hint of anything two-ishness in anything computer related, it will get the word binary prefixed to it. If a binary tree is totally balanced, this tree would have the same speeds as a sorted list and have equally fast times for inserting new records. However, if we are not careful when constructing our tree, it could become imbalanced and we could end up with a situation where the tree is just as slow as a linear search. There are a great number of variants and adjustments to the binary tree, which solve this issue of imbalance by creating ways of detecting and correcting the imbalance. Some with more branches per node are more efficient with the memory cache. Red, black trees, B trees, and the like are all fascinating topics, which I'm not going to cover in this video. However, we have gotten to the point where I can introduce my love to you. For simplicity's sake, I am going to describe to you the 16-bit implementation of the hash array mapped try. But typically, implementations use 32 or 64 bits. In the 16-bit implementation of the HAMAT, the key used is a 16-bit integer. If we want to use a larger key or something that is not an integer, then we would use a hash to reduce that value down to a 16-bit integer. For convenience, we will be thinking of this 16-bit integer as a four-digit hex number. In the HAMAT, each node has 16 children. When we start from the root node, all records whose keys end with zero will be under the zeroth node. All records whose keys end with a one will be under the next child, and so on. On the next layer down, the nodes will be split based on the second rightmost digit, again splitting them into 16 groups. Again for the third, and at the fourth layer, the links will go to the records. With this structure, we can find any record with only four steps. But its current form is a bit wasteful. We have a lot of nodes, and most of them won't even lead to stored records. However, we don't have to allocate nodes that don't have records below them. We can make use of the trick we talked about before with the bitmap sparse array. So each node of the HAMAT will look like this. To find an item in this structure on the topmost node, we look at the least four bits. We then look up the nth bit of the bitmap. If it is zero, then we know the thing we are looking for isn't in the structure. If it is one, then we can count the number of bits to the right and skip forward to the nth item and jump to the address there. We can then use the second last four bits and repeat this action. We can do this four times and get to the stored value. No matter how much data is stored in our system, it takes a constant time to look 
something up. If the key is ordered, then we can iterate through the values in an ordered fashion. It is also possible to implement this as an append only structure where we add new data on top rather than modifying the previous values in place. Doing this makes implementing concurrency and transactions very clean. It is so elegant and effective. How could you not love such a wonderful data structure? And if you love this data structure just as much as I do, okay, that's impossible. If you love this data structure even a little bit, please share your love by subscribing to this channel.